Today on The Big Story, the Land Transport Authority has incurred a $1 billion deficit in bus contracts. In the aftermath of the deadly Typhoon Hagibis, Japan picks up the pieces. And searching around coffins and dead bodies to catch tax evaders. Just how taxing is the tax man's job? Good evening and welcome to The Big Story. I'm Alyssa, coming to you live from The Straits Times newsroom. The Land Transport Authority, or LTA, has reported a deficit to the tune of $1 billion for the 2018 and 2019 financial year. This is because public bus operations have incurred losses as fares are below the cost of government contracts awarded to transport firms, including SBS Transit and SMRT. To explain this further, we have senior transport correspondent Christopher Tan. Hi, Chris. Hi. So how does the bus contract model work? Okay, what happens is that um, the LTA will carve up the island into parcels of routes and then they put this up for tender. And firms, either local or foreign, will take part in these tenders. And the lowest or second or third lowest bid, you know, based on quality and, and, and quantity, will win. And they get to operate these parcels of routes for a fixed cost over a fixed period of time, right? Uh, but they don't collect fares. So the fare revenue risks is borne by the LTA. Um, in our case, uh, when we moved to bus contracting uh, three, three years ago, uh, we didn't put up all the routes in Singapore up for competitive tender. Uh, quite a lot of it is negotiated with the incumbents, which is SBST and SMRT. Negotiated contracts would mean that uh, uh, the LTA sits down with these two uh, operators and I suppose they would have some parameters and some guidelines which they uh, you know, glean from the competitive tenders and use them to negotiate tenders, uh, negotiated contracts mm -hmm. with these two incumbents. I suppose uh, that could, you know, I mean, reason for that would be that, um, you know, maybe they don't want to expose themselves to too big a change because we are just moving into bus contract for the first time. Right, uh, and if they open it up to a lot of uh, competitive tenders, maybe you have a lot of unknowns. Um, but on the flip side, you may uh, run the risk of not having the full efficiency of comp competition, because competition. I mean, the whole whole thing about bus contracts is that you have competition, and in theory, competition drives down price. Mm. So now having um, made your points, do you think LTA should open all routes up for tender? I think eventually in the future they, they aim to do that uh, because um, the whole point, like I said, uh, for these contracts is for competition. And the more, you, more competition you get, um, the better it is. Mm. Now does the billion dollar deficit mean that the bus contract model isn't working out? It's hard to say. Um, I mean, we can look at, uh, well, first of all, we have to understand that public transport is subsidised anyway. You either subsidise it up front or you subsidise it at the back end. Um, no public transport in the world uh, is, is uh, viable just from fares alone, right? Unless you are talking about Hong Kong's MTR, which has a property component in, in, in the equation. Um, the rest of it, I think you need subsidies. Uh, in the case of Singapore, we are seeing a sudden surge in subsidies because we have moved into a new model. And the whole thing about this new model is that we want to up the service standards, right? The whole thing about this bus contract, and we feel that it is uh, better for the operators not to be encumbered by things like depreciation, you know, capex uh, assets, and all this kind of thing and they just focus on meeting service standards, okay. right? And so the government takes away the revenue risks, takes away the, the assets from them, and they just focus on that. Um, so if, let's say, the service standards that we want, right, are met, then I would say it's fair that, you know, um, that, uh, you know, it's money well spent. Uh, of course, the other question is, is a billion dollars in such a short time money well spent? We don't know yet, you see. And we have to look at other cities. Like, for instance, in London, they are spending to the tune of uh, 700 million pounds in bus subsidies this year. 
uh, without foreign, foreign exchange, uh, you know, for a dollar to dollar uh, comparison, it's lower than us, right? It's lower than us. Um, and I think a lot of other cities are also lower than us. But if we look at the uh, measurement that the LTA uses, which is a place kilometer, which is a, which is a measure of uh, capacity provided, bus capacity in, in this instance, um, and you divide it and you bring it down and, and you arrive at an amount which is four cents per place kilometer, it seems low. It seems quite uh, competitive, right? But the absolute amount, a billion dollars, by any measure, is a lot of money, mm. right? So you mentioned whether or not it's money well spent. The fact remains that this is a deficit and it's $1 billion. Yes. So moving forward, what do you think LTA will do to plug this? Because if not, it's just going to increase. Uh, in all likelihood, it, it will increase because it, it's just shot up 50% um, in the last five years, right? Um, that's what the LTA tells us. And it's worrying because we've just moved into bus contracting in such a short time. Uh, it, there is a likelihood that it will just increase. Um, well, the, the good news is that uh, Singapore, you know, is wealthy enough to bear this kind of cost. The, the bad news, of course, is that the cost will have to be split between taxpayers and commuters, right? I mean, uh, nothing is for free, right? Somebody has to bear the cost. And I think um, Transport Minister said, <coughs> Transport Minister Kogmohan said in Parliament once that he would like to see the fair formula revised. <coughs> And maybe down the road, when this formula expires, we will see a new fair formula that probably takes into account uh, this this component, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and and there is a likelihood that fares will go up. Mm. But so like I said, I think if you get the service that you want, yeah. then it's good, right? And and we have to keep an eye on operators um, to make sure that they actually meet those those uh, standards. Okay, so you were <coughs> here last week to talk about the fare review and there will be an increase on public transport. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying that in the next five years we can expect increase again. Yes, so I mean, they, of course the LTA would, of course, uh, the, other, the, other, the other thing they could do is to like uh, pare down the capacity. But of course that would mean uh, service standards would, I mean the operators would have a harder time meeting the service standards. Right now, I think the observation is that you, you, you see a lot of buses fairly empty uh, a large part of the day. Uh, you know, in between the morning and evening peaks, you see buses mm. which are fairly empty. But that's the nature of uh, public transport. You have to have capacity to cater, enough capacity to cater to the peaks. And then in between, you will have some emptiness. I mean, that's, that's the nature of public transport. That's mm. the inherent inf inefficiency. You mm. can't escape from that. Okay. Yeah. So long story short, we will be paying more for our public transport in the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In all likelihood. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on to share. Uh, for more stories on transport, you can, of course, read Chris Tan's stories on the Straits Times website. Now, sweeping through the greater Tokyo region, one of the most powerful typhoons to hit Japan in decades left in its wake a trail of destruction. At least 40 people have died, with many still missing, after Typhoon Hagibis hit on Saturday. More than 100,000 rescue workers are searching for survivors, and as of Sunday, over 100,000 homes have been left without power or water. To tell us how the Japanese are coping in the aftermath of Typhoon Hagibis, we spoke to our Japan correspondent, Walter, on the line. Can you tell us the extent of the damage to Japan caused by the typhoon? Well, this typhoon was quite unique in the sense that the damage was spread across a lot of prefectures. Um, as many as 13 prefectures were under this heavy emergency heavy rain warning and these 13 prefectures really bore the brunt of the damage. There was um, flood, widespread flooding in say, in, in, say, rivers in Nagano Prefecture, in Fukushima Prefecture, and, 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 and the extent of the damage I'm sure you can see on the screen right now. Um, yeah, so because of the widespread flooding, a lot of residents had to rescue from their roofs. Um, at least 40 people died at the last count. Um, Shinkansen trains were flooded. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is definitely one of the worst storm disasters that Japan has seen in decades. Yeah. Mm. 
Now, you experienced the typhoon yourself since you live in Tokyo. Can you tell us what it was like and <coughs> what were you doing during the typhoon? Well, to, to be honest, I was working. <laughs> I was like check, uh, tracking the news updates and trying to update the online stories. Um, I was at home basically and um, many of um, my Japanese friends, many of the public were told to actually specifically stay indoors um, because of the severity of the storm and the meteorological agency actually forecast how bad it was. It did an unprecedented a pretty much unprecedented move by issuing a heavy rate uh, by issuing a warning uh, by issuing a typhoon alert up um, as I think it was three days before the storm was due to hit usually they only do that like the day before the storm so this was quite unprecedented and because of that a lot of Japanese a lot of people were very well prepared I'm sure you have seen photos of how um, the Showers at supermarkets, at, at hardware stores were wiped out of groceries or bottled water. So really, the entire city feels like it has hunkered down to brace for the storm. And to be honest, I, I think um, Tokyo was spared the brunt of the uh, destruction. Sure, several rivers like the Tama River, at the, uh, sorry, the Tama River that borders Tokyo and Kanagawa was flooded. Sure, the Sumida River at the foot of the Tokyo Sky Street was flooded as well. Several homes were damaged, but I think because of, of how prepared the Japanese living in Tokyo were, um, Tokyo there were no there were no deaths in Tokyo at least. But you can't say the same for the more rural, the less cosmopolitan areas, of course. Yeah. Hmm. So why is that? Is it because um, they, are, they are nearer to the coastal area, so they were harder hit? Yeah, exactly. Because they were, uh, for instance, the areas that, uh, for, because Japan's terrain is quite mountainous, and 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 the and in areas which are more low lying, um, especially especially if uh, these areas are next to dams or next to rivers, they will definitely be harder hit. Given that. Um, what given that what is unique about Typhoon Hagibis is the amount of rainfall it lashed across widespread areas over twenty four hours. So this inundated many systems, and 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 because of that, there was the the widespread flooding occurred. Mm. Now yeah. there are many pictures that came uh, out of this disaster. So for one, I've noticed the flood waters are very clean, and also okay. we've already seen um, the local people, the Japanese people cleaning yeah. up as well. So they're not just leaving it to the firefighters or contractors to clean yeah. up. Uh, so is there something to be said about Japan's civic mindedness and how they've dealt with the typhoon? Has uh, their attitude towards it uh, surprised you or anything you want to comment on that? I, I, I think th there's this saying in Japanese uh, which goes shoganai, which means uh, it really can't be helped. And I think this is the psyche that has been inbred in the Japanese because of how vulnerable Japan is to natural disasters. I mean, on the day of the typhoon, there was an earthquake that struck off Chiba Prefecture as well. So, so there has been typhoons, there have been earthquakes. And, and because of that, um, there's this mentality that whatever comes, they'll just deal with it. And, and so because of that, um, and this is not the first disaster I reported on in my years in Tokyo. I mean, there was the heavy rains disaster last year. Um, there was a heat wave last year. And, and, and basically, the mentality amongst the Japanese is to just roll the punches, to just deal with it as best as, as they can. And so that's where the famous Japanese resilience and adversity comes comes from. Yeah, that's what I think. Mm. And do you think um, their Rugby World Cup win was, you know, something that kind of motivated Oh, definitely. Them? Definitely, I, I I think it was very uplifting, um, especially since um, you know that that's that's if that's an event that the Japanese can rally behind. Um, Japan is hosting a rugby World Cup. We see say some of the rugby World Cup teams actually pitching in to help um, in the cleanup efforts as well. So so there's this sense of solidarity, and there's this sense uh, there's this sense that the world pretty much is rallying behind Japan as it deals with such a mega disaster. Once again, uh, that was Walter Sim, our Japan correspondent based in Tokyo. For more updates on uh, Typhoon Hajibis, do check out the ST website. Now, there is nothing certain except for death and taxes, as the saying goes. Some tax investigators have gone as far as to search around coffins and dead bodies to catch tax evaders. This year alone has seen multiple cases of tax evaders being prosecuted by the law. Amongst them are a tuition centre owner, a second-hand car trader, casket firm owner, a pair of durian sellers, 
and a kidney specialist who managed to evade $1.4 million in taxes. So who are these tax offenders and why do they do what they do? I visited the folks at the Investigations and Forensics Division of IRAS, the National Tax Collection Agency, to find out more. In the past, we investigate mainly uh, businessmen who fail to report their income fully or claim certain expenses that are not allowable for tax purposes. Today, we deal with a lot more syndicated groups. One of the ways where businesses cheat on their taxes is by avoiding GST registration. There are businesses that suppress their business turnover to keep it below the $1 million uh, threshold. So they underdeclare it, right? Yes, yes. Another way that businesses may cheat on their taxes is by keeping the GST collected for themselves, where instead they had to actually pay it to IRAS. Now to talk about this further, we have Fabian Ko on the show. Hi Fabian. Hi. Why do people still try to evade taxes? Okay, so basically they evade taxes because uh, you know, they like money, they like to be rich, they get a bit greedy. Yeah, but I mean the tax inv investigators that I spoke to, they did say that uh, it's granted it's still a small group of people out of the entire Singapore. Yeah, but they still have to you know, have all these rules and enforcement actions carried out. Uh, and uh, from January to September this year alone, uh, IRAS, the National Tax Collection Agency, yeah, they actually collected uh, 175 million in GST and uh, prop, penalties. Uh, right? Yeah, and penalties. Uh, so they said typically how they did it. You saw the clip earlier on. I did, yeah, yeah uh, Aloysius mentioned uh, the under declaration of GST and uh, keeping of the GST collected for himself instead of paying it on to IRAS. Yeah, and then there's another method which is like, no, phantom GST uh, as they call it. So they have the individuals create uh, companies and then they create false supply chains. So multiple companies carrying out business with one another, except, except mm -hmm. there's no, actually no business transactions. Mm. Yeah, but based on all these like uh, false transactions, they claim GST. Yeah, and then they get the rebates from IRAS and that's how they make money. Mm. So in the course of doing your video and, and the story, I'm sure you've learned about a lot of inventive ways uh, that people use to evade tax. Uh, can you share with us maybe one of the more interesting ones? Well, you actually hear, it, it was quite weird actually. So we know that there was that bit about the funeral, uh, funeral companies that you're talking about, right? Yes. So the, the tax investigators shared that they went in and they had to search for the documents and uh, evidence and records that prove the of the tax offence, right? And then they had to like, move around coffees, move around dead bodies, dead bodies, eh? Dead bodies. Then, yeah. So, it's that's that's quite that's quite unusual. Uh. You will not you will not think that uh, the tax people would have to go to this extent, right? Mm. Yeah, and also there's a case where he found the documents hidden in the false ceiling of a shop. Okay. In a mall, so if I was the if I was the offender, right, I see the investigators come in, they search everywhere, they cannot find anything. I'll be like, wow, okay, very good. Then if I see him climb on the table and reach in the false ceiling, I know game over already. Yeah. Okay, so to clarify, the the tax investigator who was uh, searching around the coffins and the dead bodies, so did he manage to find what he was looking for in a coffin, or was it in the ceiling? He said he fortunately found it without much effort. Yeah, so for his sake, I hope they didn't have to actually find anything in the bodies or mm. any who was waiting to be embalmed. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about how data and AI has actually made the tax, investiga tax investigator's job a lot more efficient. Can you maybe explain, us, explain that to us? Yeah, okay, so that, that was actually one of the points which I found um, very, very interesting, mm. which is the ways they detect cases to uh, investigate and audit. So the, the use of AI, what they do is that now they, have, they can use technology, you know, this uh, uh, data analytics capabilities to sift through a lot of information. And then from there, they can study patterns and, and uh, behaviors and identify particular companies which are at high risk of evading taxes. Mm. So, so basically, the likelihood of successful operations are very much higher nowadays. So that uh, it, it actually makes them more efficient. Mm. Maybe you can give us time. one example that was in your story. Uh, this is the one where tourists were using ah, yes. false, or they were falsifying right. tourists so GST refunds. For, for Indian nationals, yeah, okay. this was shared by one of the investigators also. So for Indian nationals, they kept making uh, GST claims at the airport. Yeah, so what IRAS did was they looked at their travel patterns, they looked at the amounts that they were claiming, 
and then they found like it was quite suspicious. Mm. Yeah, so that was how they went started investigating, and in the end, they prosecuted mm. all of them. And this was always would have been a lot more difficult or troublesome if it wasn't online, correct? Correct, in correct. The old school way, mm. right? So let's talk about the old school way of. Um, doing raids. They, the, we call them whistleblowers. Ah, yes, yes. Can you tell us more about these whistleblowers and tell us what's the incentive for them? So these whistleblowers, they, they are people who have very particular information about the commission of such tax evasion. Yeah, so this, this uh, information that they have, right, is beyond just like, oh, yeah, I suspect that they are doing this or something. They actually have concrete uh, knowledge of the modus operandi of the evader and very in-depth stuff, you know. Mm. So uh, this could be people who are you know, their clients, the disgruntled competitors, or you know, sometimes even the family members of the offenders themselves. Mm. So yeah. what's in it so, for them? Mm, if the tip off leads to the recovery of taxes, right, they can actually claim up to fifteen percent of the tax sales recovered. Mm. Yeah, but kept at hundred thousand dollars. So okay. that's still a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Fabian. Uh, once again, that was Fabian. For more stories on tax evasion uh, or how to not do that, you can check out the Straight Science website. Now those were the top stories for today. For more news and videos, do head on to our website at straightstimes.com. Once again, I'm Melissa and thank you for tuning in. Join us tomorrow at the same time for more stories on The Big Story.